Yesterday, we studied the story of Sarah, but it's really difficult to study her story without also studying the story of Hagar. And Hagar's story, even if you don't know her name, it has implications today. And because of her, we hear part of her story in the news cycle almost every single day. Stay tuned. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? Or have you been in a season where it feels like He's completely silent? Have you been praying for a way to learn how to hear His voice more clearly? Hey friends, I'm Rachel, host of the Hearing Jesus Podcast. If you are ready to grow in your faith and to confidently step into your identity in Christ, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, welcome back to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, and today we are talking about Hagar. Yesterday, we studied the story of Sarah, and so if you haven't already heard that episode, I would encourage you to go back and listen to that episode first, because Sarah and Hagar really are to be studied together because their stories are so intertwined. And so just as a brief recap, Sarah was married to Abram. Abraham. So initially it was Abram and Sarai, and then the Lord changed their names to Abraham and Sarah. And so occasionally you'll hear those names interchanged. But God had given Sarah this promise that she was going to bear a child. And yet she waited until she was 90 years old before that promise came to fulfillment. And so God had promised Abraham that Sarai would become the mother of nations. And so we read about this whole thing that happened starting in Genesis 15. And what we know about Sarai or Sarah in her story is that she had a really hard time waiting. And so real briefly, I want to just read this initial promise that came in Genesis 15. It says, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliza of Damascus? And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. And so in Genesis 15, we see the initial promise that God gives Abram. And in this process, we know that Abram and Sarai are married. God tells him to go. He goes. There's this marriage that we see throughout the next couple of chapters in Genesis. But in Genesis 16, I want to read, and this is where we start hearing about Hagar's participation in this story. It says, starting at verse one, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had bore him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that was beside the road to Shur. And he said to Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. 
She gave him this name the Lord had spoke to her. You are the God who sees me, she said. I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Ber Laha Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. So what we learn in this passage is that Hagar was the slave or the bondservant or the maid of Sarai. And in all honesty, Hagar probably didn't have a lot of choice in the matter. It wasn't the same as Sarai. It wasn't necessarily open sin for Hagar because she pretty much had to do what her masters told her to do. As a servant of Sarah and Abraham, she was basically doing what they commanded her to do. And Could she have refused? Yeah, but it probably would have been very difficult and would have had significant consequence. And remember, she's from Egypt. She's not a believer. It's not like she's a follower of Yahweh. Anyone that has been in a controlling relationship may be able to understand that dynamic. I think it's really easy for us to just look at the scenario and place blame in different areas. But I've been in situations before where I've kind of gone along with what I knew wasn't probably the best decision because I felt like I had no other choice. We don't know exactly what was going on in her mind, but we can have empathy in realizing that it would not have been easy at all for her to say no. So Sarah has Isaac, and now it's an entirely new story. Jealousy comes up, not just between Sarah and Hagar, but now there's issues also between Isaac and Ishmael. So I want to fast forward to Genesis chapter 21, and this is when Hagar and Ishmael are actually sent away. Starting in verse 8, it says, The child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar, the Egyptian, had borne to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with a boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation." Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. I wonder if you recognize the impact of Hagar's story. You may not realize it, but this story has become part of world history, and we're still seeing that in today's news cycle, because the descendants of Isaac became the Jewish people, and then the descendants of Ishmael became the Arab people. So the origins of Islam, which is in direct conflict with the Jewish people, came from Ishmael. Hagar is told that Ishmael's people will be a fighting people. Remember what the Lord said back in Genesis 16. It says, verse 11, the angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. So think about this. There's a couple things I just want to point out. Hagar is the first person not just the first woman, but the first person to ever be recorded in the Bible as experiencing the angel of the Lord. And many scholars believe that the angel of the Lord was a visit from God himself. But that encounter with him did not change her heart. Here's the difference. She had an opportunity for her heart to change, 
but she never lost that spirit of rebellion. She was constantly trying to be independent and do her own thing. And then she passed that resentment and that sin and that attitude onto her son. And so her son, who scripture says he would be a wild donkey of a man, he at age probably around 17, they think he was around 17, starts to taunt this three-year-old Isaac at his weaning party, which is when he stopped nursing. So he was still essentially a baby. And because of that, Sarah says, "Uh uh-uh, get this kid out of here. And the two of them are cast out for good. The final time that we see her, she is then also trying to get an unbeliever, an Egyptian, as a wife for her son. But yet, what we know is that there is this version, this counterfeit version of what the enemy is trying to do as he is trying to corrupt the line of Christ. And so, again, we see, we see this pattern over and over in scripture. We see this counterfeit, I I think I'm going to call it counterfeit versus covenant. Instead of the covenant of God's people, we see the counterfeit of the enemy. And we see his version versus God's version. She had the opportunity to have a change of heart, but she refused. And not only did she refuse, she perpetuated that same attitude in her son. And then what happens with her son? Well, now that is responsible for the the Arab people and Islam. So Muhammad came through, through that line and Islam, which is at what's going on right now in the Middle East. I mean, you have Palestine and Israel fighting each other. That's been all over the news cycle recently. And some, so many people are saying, you know what, I just want peace in the Middle East. The reality is, is that's probably not ever going to happen until Jesus comes back. Because this was a problem that started way back in Genesis. It's not like this is a recent problem. And yes, it fleshes out in different ways. There's different political agendas that are happening. There's, you know, this side is blaming each other, back and forth. But it's probably not ever going to be resolved in our lifetime. Because the roots of this are back all the way in Genesis when we see the disobedience and we see this counterfeit version instead of the covenant version. And I think that goes back to to speak to this issue that we've been talking about this week of how there's this enemy's version of of how he wants our lives to go and there's God's version of how he wants our lives to go. Now, God still offers her salvation. God still offers her a chance. She chooses not to take it. And so we see the consequence of that. So God in his grace is still offering her this opportunity and she continues to slap his wrist and get, you know, metaphorically and just ignore everything that he's trying to do for her. But there's consequence to that. And not just for her son, but for generations to come to the point where it's still impacting nations today. And so we need to think about Hagar's story. When we are trying to do things in our own strength, in our own way, in our own stubbornness, in our own rebellion, there is a consequence. And sometimes those consequences are long lasting. Let's pray. God, it is sometimes so hard to read about and learn about Hagar's story. And yet we see the real world impact that it's making even now. God, help us to recognize that there is a counterfeit version. There is a version that the enemy would want us to have instead of your version. God, we see that so clearly in the story of Sarah and Hagar. Lord, help us to recognize those moments where you are offering us another chance. Lord, would you break into those areas of our lives where we have stubbornness or we have rebelliousness? Lord, would you help us to see ourselves in maybe some of the attitudes that we see in Hagar? And Lord, help us to be convicted by those. Lord, we know that it is you that we are looking for in the pages of the scripture. So Lord, we thank you for this picture of grace that you even offered her and and Ishmael. God, we know that you love Ishmael. We know that you love that entire line of people. So Lord, I pray that they would come to you, that they would be the ones, the ones that are existing right now, that that would break this generational cycle. Lord, we see it and we hear it. We hear stories of how people in Palestine, even now in Gaza, even now are getting visions of you. Lord, would you continue to multiply that? And Lord, when they see those visions of you, Lord, would they listen? Would they see you for who you are? And would they turn to you? Lord, we thank you that it's never too late in our story to turn to you. So Lord, I pray for the person that right now might be thinking it's too late. Lord, I pray that you would permeate their heart and their mind so much so right now that they would 
would fall on their knees and recognize that you are a God of grace and second chances. We thank you and praise you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. The Hearing Jesus podcast is so excited to partner with Compassion International. We believe in Compassion's mission to release children from poverty in Jesus' name. I've seen the impact myself through the letters and the updates that I've received as a sponsor. It's not just changing the lives of children, it's changing entire families, whole communities, always through the local church and always in Jesus' name. When you sponsor a child, you ensure access to quality education, medical checkups, healthy food, clean water, and most importantly, the love of Jesus, delivered through a church in their community because of a generous, caring sponsor like you. And you can speak life, love, and hope to your sponsored child through personal letters that you'll exchange. I hope you'll join me in sponsoring a child through Compassion today. All you have to do is pull out your phone, open up a text, and text HEARING Jesus to 83393. You'll get back a text with a picture of a child who is waiting for a sponsor and a link to sponsor that child. You can also go to compassion.com forward slash hearing Jesus to choose a boy or a girl to sponsor. When you sponsor a child, we will send you a copy of She Hears Learning to Listen to Jesus, my Bible study, as a token of our thanks for investing in the life of a child. Thank you for joining me and sponsoring a child through Compassion today. Hey friends, if this podcast helps encourage, empower, or equip you in your walk with God, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, bonus content, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you. Know that you are so loved. Keep going. Keep going.